Hi, my name is Barb Liebenstein. I'm a dairy farmer from Dundas, Minnesota, and our dairy farm's name is Wolf Creek Dairy. Today I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Aaron Cordes from the University of Minnesota, and we're going to be speaking about sustainability. It's great to see you, Barb. Great to see you too, Aaron. I just want to thank you for all that you do for all of us dairy farmers. We really appreciate it a lot. But right now, it feels like dairy is under the spot, in the spotlight to talk about greenhouse gas reduction, and it is really becoming overwhelming for us as dairy farmers. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, we can't ignore the fact that dairy cows produce methane, right? They produce methane, which is one of the greenhouse gases. Dairy is a source of a greenhouse gas, but it's not the only source. It's not the only source in the U.S. It's not the only source across the world. There are other industries that produce greenhouse gas, and I assure you, they feel they're under sim some similar scrutiny. They feel they're in a spotlight too. Dairy and other ag commodities, they play into so many different supply chains. And so when other industries are looking to reduce their greenhouse gases, they're looking through their supply chain, and that often includes dairy, which just adds to that spotlight. But I think another reason we can't ignore is that 94%, I think, is the statistic of, of farm dairy farms are family-owned, right? So when we start putting a spotlight on the dairy industry, it feels personal. It really it does, and um, I don't know that most people understand that. I think every other industry, if they need to change something, they they do it as you know motivated by economics or um, doing the right thing. And dairy farmers feel like we've been doing the right thing for a long time, and now we're going to need to step it up. And I think we're up for the challenge for sure. But another phrase that we've been using a lot is net zero. Mm -hmm. Also kind of uh, frustrating because we're not always sure what that means. Do I need to be net zero and do I need to make changes on my farm to get to be net zero? Uh, the net zero initiative um, is from the U.S. Dairy and it's a collective agreement to not only achieve net zero or zero greenhouse gas reductions across the industry, but it also considers you know, optimizing water use, improving water quality. I think oftentimes we get focused on net zero and, and greenhouse gases, but sustainable, environmental sustainability needs to be broader than just one particular impact. We need to look broader than that. And as a collective agreement, agreement, it's about not just one farm, it's not just about 10 farms, it's about everybody chipping in in different ways. Do we need to all make a change? Well, perhaps, we don't really know. The first step really for different farms is about getting a baseline. There have been baselines done for the industry as a whole, the U.S. industry as a whole. Um, but what we're talking about right now is can we get some baselines for individual farms? Because once we have those baselines and once we have some priorities in mind, whether it's greenhouse gas, whether it's water use, you know, we need somewhere to move from. And if we have that number and we understand what goes into that number, then we're in a better place to make some decisions about what is really going to change our, our metric that we want and what's really going to help us achieve our goal. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and there are many of us as dairy farmers that want to be at home and make those changes and get to net zero as quickly as possible. And some of those changes are going to be spendy. Mm -hmm. And what if we make a change and it doesn't work? Yeah. Or how are we going to negate that expense that we went through and, and nothing, nothing changed? It is, a, it is a time of risk and a time of opportunity. And you know, not, every, not every option is available or workable for every farm. I like to look at sustainability as a road trip. Whether it's to reach the net zero initiative or your own farm's personal environmental stewardship goals, I like to look at it as a road trip. There's not only one path to go from A to B. The, whether it's a net zero initiative or, or another set of goals, they may have some priorities with some particular technologies or practices mapped out, you know, that are, that are there for you to take that, as that one of those first routes on your journey from A to B. But there can be road closures, right? right. We, can, <laughs> we can have necessary detours, but we can also have op opportunities. We could have a new bridge, finally, to go across, right? And so, yes, it is a time of risk. It is a time of opportunity, and, and it's not something that we need to do overnight. You know, farms are so variable. You know, farms, different regions, even just different farms within a region, they're also variable. You know, number of cows, different policies, 
regulations in a given area. Right. Um, different weather, right? There is no one size fits all solution, uh, one size fit all approach to achieve net zero greenhouse gas reductions or improved water use or um, improved water quality, right? There is no one set path. Um, but there are opportunities. There are way, things that we can transfer from different farms to others. I think another aspect that we have to be, um, or that we can watch, is that maybe we're not in a position to make a change towards some sustainability or environmental stewardship goals right at this instant. But we can support those that are. There are farms, there are programs that are testing out new technologies, that are testing out new markets um, for carbon credits, for example. We can watch and see what's happening. We can support these other farmers that are taking some of these risks, and we can be part of those conversations. You know, listening is still a form of action. Right, and it's not really a competition. We just need to be in it all together. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right that um, if we all, if, if we all do something, or if we can't do it, just to be supportive of our other of our fellow dairy farmers is a is a huge key. And we talked about it a little bit before, but um, we have a lot of century farms, a lot mm -hmm. of third, fourth, fifth generation dairy farms, and we all feel like our definition of sustainability has long been, if we've been in business this long, that we're sustainable. Um, I'm not sure that we feel like we can make changes that are going to make us more sustainable, um, but surely we can. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I can understand you know, that Century Farm seems to be the definition of sustainability, right? Sustainability, sustain, sustaining in a broad sense is about maintaining something into the future. But I think if we look at those century farms, if we look back what they looked like, how they operated 100 years ago, and compare that to today, you know, it's not the same, right? This legacy that's been established in this farm is because of past continual improvement. That improvement may have been driven by economics, by opportunities, or even some family circumstances, right? But there was still change. And as we look to, to the future, whether it be the Net Zero Initiative, which has a an end point of 2050 or a goal point of 2050 or just your own farms and environmental stewardship goals. It's not about tomorrow, right? Making it day to day, we can't, <laughs> can't de-emphasize that enough. Resiliency, that resiliency to, to weather, these, weather these storms that do come up all the time, that's, that's critical. But when we talk about sustainable development, think more of strategic planning. How are we setting things up for the next generation on our farms? You put that so well, um, and that's exactly how we feel, too. It's a definitely an evolving science, and agriculture just keeps um, standing up for the challenges that come with it. Um, mm -hmm. So sustainability also seems to be governed by those that are not closely involved with our business, and that gets a little bit frustrating, too, and I don't know how we handle um, having people from outside trying to tell us what to do and I understand what's in it for us is that you know we need to have a market to send our product to but why is it that all these people <laughs> want to tell us what to do? Sustainability conversations are hard because oftentimes our definitions of what is sustainable don't align. They might not align because of our perspectives that we're coming from you know, some might have more of a global perspective, some might have more of a regional perspective. It could be because of what our priorities are, right? The Net Zero Initiative has greenhouse gases, water use, and water quality as priorities, but other people might prioritize one or none of those in their definitions. And just simply understanding what these different, different definitions are in a conversation I find very valuable. When I enter into some of these conversations as, as little one-offs oftentimes, one-on-one, -on -one, that's one of my first questions oftentimes. What, what do you think is sustainable? Sometimes it's very focused on greenhouse gases or climate change, and other times it's much broader. But just simply asking that question gives us a, a good starting point for moving forward in a conversation. Sometimes those conversations can bring in terms that we're not familiar with, that we're not comfortable with, that go deeper into some of that sustainability science um, in setting, offsetting, LCAs, right? There's, there's a lot of right. different terms that come into these conversations. Do we have to be proficient at them all? No, not necessarily. I think it's important to con try and continuously learn what some of it means, but we're never going to be, all of us, proficient in every, in every aspect of it. 
But I think, you know, some of that trepidation, some of that fear we hear when we hear these words that we don't understand, I think we have to recognize the audiences we're talking to, they probably feel the same way when someone in the ag industry ta starts talking about their animals, their practices, their farm, right? There's, I think, some trepidation on both sides. And so how do we create a more two -way, <laughs> two -way, some two-way lanes for this conversation? Well, I think it's always valuable to ask questions ask some clarifying questions about what do they mean by this particular term, but also being open to answering questions when they ask you questions about your operation. I've never seen egg shy away from that particular <laughs> no. aspect, but I think it's, it's going to continue to be part of these conversations and can open up some richer, richer dialogue. The last part that I would recommend is having one of those baseline numbers in your, in your back pocket, whether it's from an environmental stewardship assessment or, or some other metric, you know, one number is not going to satisfy all critics by any means. But having a number, having a metric specific to your farm, specific to what you are doing, if nothing else, just demonstrates some engagement. It demonstrates an interest in how we move forward. It's very valuable. Right. And it's all about learning more all the time. Exactly. And I really like the idea that it's building relationships first, um, getting to know each other. It's really hard not to um, have a have a good conversation when you have some starting point to um, build on. We're probably never going to be completely in line with our definitions, right? Right. But we can make it make any of these conversations a learning experience for all. Exactly. So, Aaron, thank you so much for your time, and again, thank you for all that you do for dairy farmers. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate all that dairy does for the country as well.